Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sit through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. And today, we're talking about... Breaking and replacing New Year's resolutions. So, you can participate in this in any way if you've already made New Year's resolutions or already broke your New Year's resolutions or don't have any. This is all very useful because we're going to talk about why there's nothing really special about New Year's itself and how it might be better to think of it less in terms of resolutions and more in terms of goals. And we've got a lot of cool stuff lined up, but we should talk first about this. I mean, what would you call it? It's a tradition. It's a practice. It's something a lot of people do. Did your family always do New Year's resolutions, Dan? No, not really. There was nothing like codified as something to do to to present them um, to each other it's yeah it was just you know it's something that's in the the general milieu of being you know in the united states i guess see in my it's family, probably other places as well yeah and and among friends it was a very common thing getting together at like new year's parties to do two things one was to make new year's resolutions and then to make new year's predictions And we'd write the predictions down and put them in like an envelope or something like that and then get them out, you know, the next year and see if any of them came true. But it was considered kind of important to make some sort of New Year's resolution. I don't know. Maybe my family was a little bit more moralistic than than yours was or, you know, but there's something of that. And and I think you're right. It's become a, a general feature of American culture. And it's, you know, it's not something radically new. I mean, people have been celebrating New Year's um, since, you know, the, well, let's, let's just call it the dawn of civilization because some of the oldest civilizations around did, in fact, have some sort of New Year's celebrations and they did sometimes have resolutions. So we see um, Babylonian um, Iranian, you know, that's still carried through with Nowruz today. Um, Chinese New Year is a big deal. Um, the Romans had their New Year's celebrations that were associated with, with Giannis, this, uh, two headed god. And people would sometimes take the opportunity to do a little bit of thinking about their life and how screwed up it is and how they might want to get it back on track. And some of them would make, um, commitments. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that they were called resolutions. And the polling right now says that about 40 to 50% of Americans make New Year's resolutions. So that's a lot of people. And I don't know what it's like in in Europe or in South America or other places. But I mean, that's probably enough that we could hash this topic out quite a bit. Yeah. So like personally, yeah, I don't find there like we've defined at a moment of a, you know, an arbitrary position based on tradition <laughs> uh, of of creating some sort of resolution based on the new year and yeah. you know at least within the northern hemisphere of the world i wouldn't really consider you know the doldrums of winter to be the best time to actually start implementing big new changes in your life I, well, they could be, though. I mean, yeah. so it's the I, darkest time of the year. I mean, it's not mm-hmm. the solstice itself, right? The solstice yeah. is a little bit earlier, but it's still pretty dark a lot of the time. And it's that weird kind of end of the year, you know, the holidays, we call it. But a lot of it means we're just kind of floating and and having obligations that have to do with, you know, colleagues or family or stuff like that. For those of us who are academics, you know, we're in the break in between uh, fall semester and, and spring semester, or perhaps January term that might be starting up for some. And so, you know, it could be a good time to like take some time and reflect. I mean, is it the best time to make 
big decisions just because it's the, the turning over of a new year? Maybe not. Yeah, you're probably right. I, about I don't that. know about this, making the decisions themselves, but okay. starting to implement them. And I would, and I guess I will oh, maybe so we've got curtail three this there, right? We've got reflection. We've got making the decision. We've got implementing the decision. And maybe it's not fortuitous for all three of them, right? Right, and especially if we're talking about some sort of uh, athletic, okay, um, thing, and where it's the best and easiest to do this outside, but if it's oh, right. you know, ten degrees out outside, like it is currently, <laughs> yeah. um, I don't really don't want to start a, a running routine starting at ten degrees. So there, there are places where these become easier to implement, um, and so for those types of things, I'd actually say the implementation might be better started at if you're going to choose an arbitrary point yeah you know um the equinox and or easter yeah i think especially here in wisconsin i think you're mm-hmm. you're right um i mean if you're living in california i guess you could do whatever you want whenever you want basically right um and in some places it might be too hot during the what they have of spring and summer and fall to do much outdoor stuff. Uh, but, I mean, you could do ice skating, right? You could pick up ice skating. We can't do cross-country skiing because, unfortunately, we don't get as much snow anymore as we right. used to. Um, but, you know, you could do other things. I will say this, though. We know that lots and lots and lots of people will purchase gym memberships or renew gym memberships. Mm-hmm. And uh, January is the month where gyms make their most money because people are mm-hmm. signing up for things. And what we know is that most of these people are not going to follow through for more than a few weeks. And so and that's built into the, the business model of most of these gym memberships, especially <laughs> the ones that are cheap. So if you look at your, your uh, $10, $15 a month, gym membership places, they expect only, you know, 20% yeah. of the people that actually have memberships to actually use it. This is a little bit off topic, but I suspect, and you tell me what you think about this, that if you're only paying 10 or $15 a month, it's a lot easier to like keep it and and not cancel it because you're not paying 100 bucks a month, right? So if you're paying 100 bucks a month and it gets to be March and you're like, I haven't gone to the gym more than, you know, three times then that's an expense to cut. But if it's just, you know, the cost of Netflix, basically, or some other streaming service, eh, who, you know, who notices, right? It's just a couple, couple coffees or, uh, it's not even, you know, it's, it's a portion of a tank of gas. It, it doesn't, uh, doesn't add up. So maybe people just keep the meter running for months and months and years and years. Yeah. You know, it's it's easy to say. Oh yeah, it's I can go to the gym next month. I always have access to it, yeah. But not actually do it. But yeah, if, if you're going to high end place, hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred dollars a month, you're like, I need to get my money's worth, or that needs to go. Yeah, that's a good good way of putting it. I have access to it whenever I want, right? And and you can just kind of keep it in the back of your mind as well. I could be going to the gym. I'll do it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um. Another thing is that uh, basically we have these New Year's resolutions because it is a it's, it's probably a good thing to try to reflect and maybe make changes on our lives. Um, yeah, and having a you know an annual tradition to do that that's a perfectly fine thing. But the best time to make change is when you realize that there is something wrong in your life, and so you know it is nice to have a a reminder. Um, but one shouldn't wait until New Year's to start changing something in their life if they see that there's something wrong. Yeah. I mean, you could have something like a deferred resolution, right? A, a resolution to do a resolution later on where you're like, listen, well, like you were saying, you know, um, I'm, I'm not going to start running in January in Milwaukee. I mean, there's ice all over the place and it's cold and like the wind today was super blustery. I wouldn't want to be out there running, but come, you know, end of March, April, that that might not be so bad. I think, you know, I used to run track when I was in high school and I kind of think that we started running um like end of January, early February, but I also remembered it really sucked, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I bet if you're doing it in high school and you're a freshman and that's your first experience of like running, how how many people 
you know, drop out of track and field that first week of like, it's really bad and bliss, uh, blustery. Yeah. Good question. Um, or, you know, in, in, if you're coming in and joining cross country, it's hot, right? You're, you're beginning mm-hmm. it, uh, when it's still summer and you got to run all these miles. And, you know, if you, if you are a freshman, you're going to be lagging behind all these upper class people who, uh, are much better runners than you. And yeah. Yeah. So, okay. What are some of the, the resolutions that people uh, tend to make? Yeah. So there's this, this site called ghostskills.com. And I don't know that this is the definitive list. I think it's a plausible list of the most common resolutions. So here's, here's what they are. Um, exercise more. We already talked about that. Lose weight, get organized, learn a new skill or hobby, live life to the fullest, save more money or spend less money, quit smoking, spend time, more time with family and friends, travel more and read more. Now, I mean, I'm kind of curious, what do you make of that particular list? It's probably accurate about what Mm -hmm. people do pledge, but what do you notice about all of these, not, not all, but most of these resolutions? They're kind of wishy-washy. There's no actual demonstrable thing that you can say, I've either made it or not. Okay. I mean, lose so like, weight, you can say, well, if you ended the year at the same weight, you haven't lost weight. Right. But like, oh, I lost a pound? Well, like, hooray. <laughs> like, sure, good good on you. But like, that's also within like the, the just the natural fluctuations of your weight it's going to have. <laughs> yeah, it, might be, it might be because the scale's slightly off. Or, you know. <laughs> right. Um. But yeah, I, I see it. You know, most of these are uh, especially like get organized. How, how do you define what is organized? Like, what what is your criteria for um, what does living life to the fullest actually mean? That one seems to be the vaguest one, right? <laughs> yeah. What do you think though about the learn a new skill or hobby? Um, I mean, it's not specifying what the mm-hmm. skill is. You don't really learn a hobby. I, I think you, you acquire a hobby, but um, yeah, there are skills that are entailed within a hobby. Yeah. Like stamp collecting, you got to figure out how to put it into your little book. And, you know, um, if you're doing rabbit grooming, you got to learn how to use a comb or something. Or, you know, we could probably come up with all sorts of skill lists, right? Oh, sure. Uh, rabbit grooming. Sorry, you threw me off there. <laughs> you know, I, I was just thinking when I was a kid um, growing up out in the sticks, 4 H was super big. And mm-hmm. my mom wanted me to be involved in, in 4 H. And some of the other people who were involved in 4-H in my neighborhood, they were – I don't know how 4-H is organized because it's been so long since I looked at it. But there's something like you you specialize in different areas. And these people had rabbits. And I thought, well, rabbits are pretty cool, you know. Uh, maybe I could get into this. And then I found out all the work that was involved in rabbits and I quickly decided, no, nah, this, this is not for me. <laughs> But I, I mean, there are people who, you know, probably make that their their hobby, right? And there would be a whole bunch of skills involved, like you're saying, but none of them are specified in the actual resolution. If I if I say, well, I'm going to become really good with guinea pigs, or mm. I don't know what else you, you could you could pick. What do you think though about the um, read more? That's quantifiable, right? Yeah, but like. It's still not like a like I would I, if I was going to set some sort of resolution, um, it, for a quantifiable one, I'd see like okay, I would I would like to read down ten books this year. Okay, that, that's kind of a low low goal, but that is a goal that is demonstrable. Um, but you know, as we'll get into later, I don't actually think those types of goals are actually good. So why not? I mean, let's give a little preview. Okay, so uh, basically. Uh, one um, that you're once you've hit that goal, then you no longer have any motivation to continue doing that. Okay. So hey, maybe maybe you go on a, a tear and you get to your ten go- uh, books uh, by March. Yeah. Um. And now, hey, I, I did it! Hooray! Um. Did you? Ever- but as, as I'll show 
later, like one of the better ways to do this is to like define, like, oh, I might want to read an hour every night, yeah. or we read an hour every night, you know, five nights a week or something. You know, Did you ever you wanna... participate, like, as as a you know grade schooler or high schooler in one of those summer library reading programs? Yeah, did not do well in those. What? Why not? <laughs> I I don't know. Um. Like the pizza wasn't a good motivation. It's usually the thing that you got. <laughs> uh, because I, I guess looking back, there was no structure to how I was going to achieve those goals. Yeah, there was just a goal that kind of like floated out there. Um, I kind of think that exactly what you were talking about just a couple minutes ago, where somebody's like, "Well, I got to read ten books. All right, so I'll read these ten books. Now I'm done." I don't have to mm-hmm. read anything more. It, there's there's something that's missing there about why reading is valuable. I mean, mm-hmm. I never had any problem with it because I was always reading books anyway. So I'd be like, well, I'll just count the books I'm already reading and get the prizes or whatever it is that they're they're offering, get my mom off my back or, you know, whatever whatever the <laughs> impetus was. But it was totally extrinsic to what my activity already was. It would be sort of like, you know, in my case – um, saying, well, you gotta, you know, you, you, you need to drink water each day. And I'd be like, well, I already drink water each day. So that's covered. I'm, I'm good with that, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, as we'll get into it later, but like, you know, what are some of the, um, the patterns or, or the resolutions that you've got had in the past? Well, I've made some good ones and some bad ones. And I think we could probably all say that, right? <laughs> So yeah, right. The best New Year's resolution that I ever made was one that got me out of a toxic relationship. Um, and I, it was back in graduate school. I was dating this woman and she was just, you know, all sorts of bad news, uh, in all sorts of other ways. And then actually, you know, like, uh, sharing stories with others who had, who had gone out with her, I found that this was like a, a pattern. But, um, I broke up with her at New Year's. I called her. I remember I said, I'm breaking up with you and that's my new year's resolution and I'm going <laughs> to stick to it. And I did. And, um, you know, that was, so that's a good one. Right. Uh, but that's mm-hmm. uh, basically, you just got to not date that person anymore. So it's not that difficult of a resolution. I, I've made all sorts of other ones that I haven't been able to follow through on. Like, you know, I learned a bit of Mandarin when I was in college, and I've always said, well, this will be the year I buckle down and finally, you know, study and learn more than 250 characters. Never happens. Um, I've started out okay with that, but it's never really gotten through. Um, I've said I would drop 50 pounds and get in shape. That's a bit ambitious for somebody like me, I think. Um, I actually have lost 30 pounds this year. Um, oh. But I didn't do it by making a New Year's resolution. I did it by getting back to the gym and doing weight circuit training, which turned out to be pretty pretty useful. And I was very surprised <laughs> when I got on the <laughs> scale. Um, what else? Um, I've said I wouldn't argue with my wife. Um, that, you know, I mean, going a year without that. I mean, think about Epictetus's discourses where he's talking about anger and he's like, you know, if you make it one day without losing your temper, then mark it down. If you go three days, now you're actually, now you're, you're, as we say, you're cooking with gas, right? If you make 30 days, then go in and offer a sacrifice to the gods because you've, you've accomplished something really major. I, I don't go a, a week without arguing with anybody who's close to me, I think, you know? <laughs> so, so that was, you know, some of these resolutions have to not just be actionable and specified. They actually have to be things that you could plausibly do. <laughs> <laughs> Not just aspirational. Now, what about you? you you've, you've made resolutions in the past, right? Yeah. Like, um, what is it? I, I took a kinesiology course in college, and that was one of the really – the first times that like, I actually knew some science behind okay. um, both diet and exercise and how these things work in a more robust, uh, systematized way. And so uh, one of the resolutions that I had there was to – a run a half marathon. Oh, um, yeah. 
and that's so a lot of running. Um, <laughs> it is a lot of running because it's it takes a long time to get your uh, stamina stamina up to the point where you can actually do you know the was it thirteen Thir- thirteen miles point right one miles yeah oh man so um I've but, never run that uh, that that far in my life <laughs> the the longest I ever ran was ten miles and that was once <laughs> yeah um. But I found a really uh, good program and and set up the entire thing. It's like you know you've got six days a week that you run, and then the seventh day you do something else that's active but that's not running, so like riding a bike or something. Um, and so you you go between like short runs and longer runs. Short, so you start out like doing like two miles, um, and then you do like a, a four mile run, and oh. it, it keeps on going up until your like average run, your slow, or short run is like five miles, and then you're just starting to do like eight, nine, ten, eleven run miles. Okay. And um, I was I'm really good on that. I followed that through to the T, partly because I I created a really achievable goal and uh, you know every once in a while i might not be able to make it one day and i just kind of like dropped it like that's okay, okay. There, there's the rest of the thing i just keep on going um try to hit my metrics um until i, I hurt my foot uh, one day when i was doing a, oh. like a, a 12 mile run so i got like at least 11 miles up into it and i hurt my foot and i started taking up more biking but i, th- I ca- counted that as a win because um, I had gotten to the point where I could run for fun. That I got that that point of like getting the runners high and be able to like just kind of like go into the ru- woods and running on trails and just enjoying that experience. Yeah, and I think that was more important in the end. Like that, I I was able to um see really continual improvement um over a long period of time. That does strike me as as something really important, and and maybe we'll come back to that as an example when we're looking at um how to rework resolutions because it would have been really easy to say, I'm going to run every day. Why? Because I want to do this half marathon, but instead you set up the half marathon as a thing that you're shooting for. And then you, Mm -hmm. you've got some flexibility in the means that you choose to attain it. And then you've, you've created sort of a secondary, we'll call it a secondary goal. Although you, you could actually think of it as a, like another resolution. I've got this program. I'm going to stick to this program. And then, after uh, things didn't work out, you were still able to see how there was benefit there. And I think a lot of people who make resolutions, this is jumping ahead a bit again, if, if, they, if things don't work out with their resolution, they feel really bad because right. they've invested so much in things being this particular way. You know, So like if you had insisted, oh, it's got to be a half marathon rather than it's got to be long-term consistent exercise, I think you would have probably felt bad right right um but like you know as we we, i think we'll talk about later it's like you gotta know that there are certain things that are outside of your control um and you know i hurt myself it made it so that i was uh unable to run for you know at least a month of and and so that really you know sets you back and and by that time i was able to I, I took up biking a lot more, and I just like, well, that's now my new big cardio thing, and I would go on like, you know, twenty mile rides. Yeah, which which is also quite nice. I mean, one of the things that's nice about running or walking is getting out in nature and seeing things, you know, and like you said, the the whole moving your body aspect, and you can do that just as well on a bike, I suppose, mm-hmm. as, as any anything else, right? Yeah, and I think one of the other things that was. Um, motivating me at that point in time was there's a quote from socrates about like oh uh something along the lines of it's it is a travesty if a man does not know the full extent of what their body can do Mm. okay uh yeah it's interesting you know this is a total digression but we we think about these ancient philosophers and we think of them as, you know, big brains walking around and it, what do we get to see most of the time is their, their, their thoughts that are written down in dialogue form or treaties form or letter form or stuff like that. And we forget that almost all of them engaged in physical discipline and exercise. Um, some of the philosophy schools were actually at gymnasiums, you know, the Kunosarges, uh, where the cynics went was a gymnasium. Um, and, 
all of them, they, they didn't think that the body was the most important thing. Obviously, they, you know, the life of the mind, I think they thought the mind was most important. But they did think that you don't want your body to be an impediment to mental activity. You want it healthy. You want it strong. You want it able to get around and do the things that it needs to do. And some of them, as they were older, like Socrates or like Seneca, um, they had, you know, uh, a decent life because they had attended to their their body's needs. Yeah. So I just pulled up the quote really quick. No man has the right to be an amateur in the matter of physical training. Mm. It is a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty and strength which his body is capable. That's that's pretty good. Yeah. You know, actually, I'll, I'll mention another thing that I, I was saying jokingly with a few uh, friends earlier. You know, John Madden died recently, the great mm. um, uh, NFL commentator and, and, you know, athlete and all that. But, you know, he once he got out, he didn't really look that athletic um, once he started eating and, and mm-hmm. less exercise. And the guy made it to 85 years old. <laughs> you know, you look at John Madden and you're like, how did this guy make it to 85? And then I, I think about that myself. I'm I'm 51 uh, this uh, th- this last year, and I say, well, you know, I'm past the halfway point. But if Madden can make it to 85, I bet if I exercise and you know eat the right stuff, provided I don't get hit by the bus or you know die of some disease or something like that, I'll, I'll get to 85, and, I, and that gives me something to look forward to because then I think, and maybe this can tie back into resolutions. I think, oh, you know, the end is not that close. I've still got plenty of time to work on the stuff that I want to work on. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I mean, you're well, on the other side of that, you know, in your in your 30s. Are you mm-hmm. starting to like think in terms of what, you know, what you want to do in the decades to come, how you know, what condition you want to be in or you know, these are things that go oh. beyond like a one-year resolution, right? Oh yeah. These are like it's a kind of like a lifetime habit type thing. And I I've looked at the, the studies about uh what makes your life not only long but also enjoyable into your old age and definitely one of them is one of the things that you do which is uh strength training yeah um having a regular strength training uh, regimen both um maintains the uh strength of not only your uh muscles but also your bones and, and right those, those are one of the main things that will allow you to be maintain your mobility you know long into your life and once you lose your mobility you're it's it's a pretty it becomes more and more decline, difficult yeah, to yeah. yeah well let's come, so um yeah let's come back to resolutions so what is it that rev- resolutions reveal to us when we look at those that people make or our own i think there's a lot of stuff you know we we get to see you know if somebody's making a resolution presumably it's about something that they consider to be important or valuable so right. you know when we see that well you know look at this list right you know we have all these physical things we should read more spend more time with family those sound like pretty good things um lose weight might be a good thing or, or not a good thing depending on you know what kind of um what kind of weight you're carrying? Get organized. Uh, you know, it's nice to be organized, but for what? What? What's the point of of the organization? I mean, somebody could be organized just for the sake of being organized, or they could like have bought into the uh, Marie Kondo thing and be all about, you know, does this spark joy? No, let's get rid of it. You know, I only have fifty books. Um, you can buy into programs like that, and and that can be what a person values more than anything else, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this uh, whole prioritization and also the fact that we only have, you know, everyone's only got 24 hours a day, right? Right, yeah. And we only can focus on so many things within that a lot amount of time. And, oh, what is that guy? The uh, the Oracle of Omaha. Um, oh, uh, is that Warren uh, Buffett? Yeah. Okay. So, um, there was a little missive that he put out once which was uh okay take the the 10 most important things in your life and prioritize them put them all on a list okay and once you've done that chop off the bottom seven 
because you only have time for three. Wow. To do only if you actually want to do them well, to not be stretched too thin, you have three goals. And that was really kind of like an interesting oh, what what can I actually succeed at well? Yeah. And and what are the the three things that I'm going to prioritize in my life? Yeah, that would be tough for me. I would. I mean, now that you've already given away the spoiler, it'd be probably yeah. be tougher because there's a temptation <laughs> to like think about what sort of list I ought to have. You know, mm-hmm. um, what kind of li- what kind of list I desire to be the kind of person who would generate. You know, uh, mm-hmm. and I, actually, I, I wanted to say something about this. There's this notion of second order desires that we've talked about before in the past. And for those who are listening, second order desires are not desires for something uh, specifically like, you know, I desire to have a ham sandwich or I desire to go lay down and take a nap or, you know, I desire to go and pet my cat or something like that. They're instead second order desires are desires about desires. So they're desires about what we what, what we would like to desire. So I can, well, the exercise thing is a great example, right? There are some times when um, I make myself go to the gym and I don't really want to go to the gym. And I kind of would like to be the, the sort of person who would want to go to the gym because I know it's good for me. I, I know that my desires that I have are kind of out of whack. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's a good thing to have those second order desires. Cause those are how you talked about prioritization that helps us to, to prioritize, but there's also a danger involved with it that I think comes up quite a bit with resolutions, which is of being much more aspirational than realistic. You know, I can say, mm-hmm. I would like to be the kind of person who, and then the the New Year's resolution is a way for me to make myself think that I'm on the path to being that kind of person. Right. Um. So I guess, uh, who are we um resolving these things for? To whom? Yeah, I mean that's something worth considering as well. Resolutions are kind of like promises or vows or maybe there's some other words that we would use i you know i resolve it's what we call a performative speech act right uh Mm -hmm. it's it's something that we're making and now um in the in the distant past people made these to the gods you know Mm -hmm. as zeus is my witness i will do this (laughs) or this or this right um i don't think we're doing that too much today as a matter of fact New Year's resolutions, I don't know any any people who are um, religious believers today who view their New Year's resolutions as like a pact with God or anything. Maybe there are. Maybe my my range of experience is just too narrow. I mean, do you at all? No, or? not okay. at all. So who are they to? Are they – we could make they, them to others, I guess. Yeah, we could – Say they're to us, potentially. Um, but okay, so if they're if they are to other people, yeah. Why are they to other people? Let's go back to that. Uh, so why? Um, maybe because I feel like if I do this thing, then I will fit more into a socially acceptable yeah. box. Yeah. Um, and so I'm re- making these resolutions in you know, benefit of the community and what I think that the community wants me to be. Well, that's interesting because that's like, that's also aspirational, but it's like taking somebody else's ideas about the person that you ought to be and trying to live up to that. Right. Right. I mean, I don't know if that's a good reason, but that is a place that one could resolve it to. Yeah. I mean, I think it could be as trivial as like everybody's gotten together on New Year's Eve and everyone else has made resolutions and you're like, well, I don't want to be the odd guy out. So I better come up with some sort of resolution on the spot. <laughs> well, I've resolved to not resol- or have any resolutions. Yeah. That's like when I was a kid <laughs> and, and they'd ask us, what are you giving up for Lent? And we'd say, I'm giving up giving things up, right? It's a, it's a meta <laughs> thing. But, yeah, 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 you know, you could also, I mean, you could be in like a relationship with somebody who's very big about 
resolutions and all this sort of stuff mm-hmm. and they could pressure you you have to have a resolution you know i want you to be the kind of person who is continually making progress and developing in their life right and and maybe you're not so into that but you're you're into the the relationship and so you take it on that would be a possibility right that would be to somebody else yeah um I'd say uh, another one is to our future selves. If you oh. consider uh, not ourselves at the moment, but like the uh, the person that we you know aspire to be. Yeah. In that case, it gets more complicated if you think it through, right? Because a resolution is this promise about what you're going to do from this point onward into the future. So it is indeed your future self in some way who has to carry out the stupid resolution that you committed yourself to as past (laughs) self, right? Or as present self. And yet you're also making this as a resolution to that same future self. So if they complain about it, you can say, well, this is for your own good. Yeah. (laughs) Um. I didn't write this down, but it just popped in my head because it's something else I wrote down. Yeah. Um, you resolve to a judge. It doesn't have to be like a, a, a judge in a court of law, but someone that is actually oh. going to judge you and potentially hold you accountable. Okay, yeah. For yeah. not doing that. And so not only is it just kind of like a wishy-washy thing to um, your, your future self or just you know something that you say, but there are actually – you can build in consequences. Yeah. To not actually doing that. And once you've made that resolution, um, you can uh, be held accountable. Yeah. And that might actually be a way of getting people to follow through on those resolutions, right? Right. I'll get to that later. What if you make a resolution in social media, you know, and you're – being kind of braggy about it or you know, oh. being very public about it. Have you made a commitment to like all of your followers or friends or whatever, whatever else you got going on, uh, you know, different platforms have different ways Good. of calling it. I guess it depends on um, how much you want to, you uh, worry about being called a hypocrite. Okay. That doesn't seem to bother many people at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> Especially um, influencers, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, when I went on my big, uh, like, habits kick a while ago, one of the yeah. things I did find was there was a number of studies talking about saying your resolutions out loud. If you say that I'm going to do this to someone, um, it doesn't have to be at New Year's, but like whenever you say I'm going to do this, yeah, your brain kicks you out a little bit of dopamine. Yeah, yeah, and it. And it, the very the very same the pathways that you usually get as reward for actually doing it, and so, um, especially if you go around and telling all sorts of people that this is the thing, this, this is the grand good thing that I'm going to do, um, actually makes it more difficult for you to actually do that thing. Yeah, because the brain is already getting the reward that it would have got if it had actually done the thing in the first place. That is a big problem for writers. Um, you, you go to a writing group and there's lots and lots of writing groups and then you tell people about your project and then mm. you're not going to get your project done. And then you get to see them the next week and they're like, how are you, how's your project going? And you're like, well, mm. I didn't make as much progress as I, I thought, but I did have these really cool ideas about the other stuff I'm going to put in the book or whatever it's going to be. <laughs> right? I want to know. I, we should uh, do that with the radio show. We should be like. You know, we're coming up to our 50th episode pretty soon. We should be like, you know, we're practically at our 200th episode. And right. we've talked about all these other things that we haven't actually talked about. You know, we can just project them. Right. Uh, isn't There's a, a quote, which is, writing is the art of applying butt to seats. Oh, Yeah. You know, Ursula K. Le Guin actually has this essay, and I don't remember which which uh, particular book of her nonfiction it's in. But you know, she actually did a lot of writing workshops and you know talks to potential writers, and she stressed she's like, "You're not going to want to hear this, but if you want to become a writer, you must write and then write and then write. You can't like 
talk to people at the coffee shop about it. You can't just do outlines. You have to sit down and actually write stuff. And she, she goes on to say, you know, most of the stuff that you write for a while is going to be kind of crap and you're, you know, you're going to get attached to it because it's your baby, but it, it really is crap. And you need to be able to move on and, and write some more stuff rather than sitting down to edit the stuff that you've got. That's not particularly good. Just keep on plowing through it. It's sort of like running, right? I mean, mm. <laughs> imagine if you were like, I'm training for a half marathon and I did run this one mile stretch. I'm just going to go back over that one mile stretch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, this, um, you, you, you bring up this idea of like being an artist and, and creating something that is art. And most yeah. artists have the eye of what is good art before they have the ability mm. to know to actually make that good art. Okay. And that results in a lot of artists, whichever the medium, to be disillusioned at their especially their early work, because they see what they produce and they see it in comparison to what they know is good. Yeah, and they yeah. know that they are absolutely lacking. Um, but you just gotta keep on producing, because that's the only way you're gonna get to a point where Something that you're producing is uh, actually beneficial. You know, that reminds me of somebody <clears throat> who um, I, I teach in my classes sometimes who's uh, a very undervalued philosophical stock, and his name is Lev or Leo, depending on how it's translated, Shestov. And he was a, a Russian Jewish philosopher who grew up in Russia, left after the revolution, made his way to Paris. And then, you know, he, he, he'd written a lot of books before that. And then he wrote quite a few after that. And in his book, All Things Are Possible, he talks about how um, a lot of ordinary people, they think, oh, creative activity must be so awesome. You know, I look at the product. Imagine what it must be like to produce this thing. It must be like fun all day long. And he says, <laughs> that is an incorrect argument. You know, you're, you're thinking that because you're looking at it from the wrong side. You're not seeing what it's like for the, the poor bastard artist who is like tearing his hair out, trying to go over the same lines, unhappy with them day after day after day. All you get to see is the finished product and the finished product looks great. <laughs> <laughs> and it's <Right>. wonderful, but <laughs> it, you you didn't get to see any of the back end where if we want to mix some more metaphors where the sausage was being made, you know? Right. All right. Uh, I think we should really move on to um, some positive or negatives about yeah. uh, resolutions. So what is positive about making New Year's resolutions? I mean, you've already said maybe it's, you know, there's nothing special about New Year's. Um, what's What's good about it? You got a a time that is a tradition in order to, at the very least, reflect upon your things, your life, and make some decisions about potentially changing. That's always a good reflection is, um, in a productive sense, is usually a good thing for people. Yeah. Um, as long as you're not, like, uh, obsessively ruminating. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. Um, uh, but, you know, we also... We're looking at like, oh, how how do we, how would I like to see myself in the future? Like, what are the things that I can prove about myself? Um, you know, uh, thinking about the relationships as well as the the actions that you want to do, and you know, definitely finding some really concrete steps in order to try to achieve those results. Yeah, that seems to be very important. And if you don't make a resolution, you're you're not going to come up with concrete steps, right? Concrete steps mm -hmm. are more than a, the resolution, but you got to do the one before the other. What's yeah. what's problematic then about New Year's resolutions? Um, setting yourself up for failure. If you if you don't do these well, then you can set yourself back. Uh, so this is going to be the year that I you know, <laughs> do something grand. Like I'm I'm going to write the next American novel. Um, you know, the great American novel, or I'm, I'm going to, you know, this year I'm going to be elected president. You know, you know <laughs> <laughs> there are certain things that, especially um, this year when it's not an election year, are unattainable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could always modify it and be like, I'll be president of the Homeowners Association or president right. of the chess club or, you know, something like that. But yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of really unrealistic resolutions people make. Um, I mean, the one that you brought up before with like running the half marathon. If if you were 80 years old, maybe that wouldn't be doable. If you're in your 20s, okay, that's 
that's pretty doable within the scope of a year, right? Um, I'm going to learn how to master the guitar, probably not doable in a year. You know, you could probably make some good progress a lot more than you would if you never picked up a guitar, but there's, there's, yeah, these, this is going to be the year. And I think some of the ones that, that we were talking about earlier, like getting organized, this is going to be the year I really get organized. I I think a lot of people, um, mess that one up. Yeah. What about, what do you think about the, the, the time thing? Is New Year's really the best time for coming up with, let's say you had to pick a time during the year. Mm -hmm. Is New Year's Uh, definitely wouldn't be New Year's because I've got seasonal affective disorder and (laughs) okay. That's a good consideration. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Knowing your, your rhythms and how, when you are most at a a good place to actually start implement or even thinking about these things, it's probably a good idea. So how does sad, because I think maybe some of our listeners, you know, here in Wisconsin, it's a big problem, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's cold and it's dark, but some of our listeners might be in places where it's not like that. How does that, how does that psychologically affect your decision making? Does it, does it lead to um, a general malaise, you know, kind of like a low level depression depression um it's it just you know it saps the energy mm. um and uh maybe you know reduces one's zest for life you know i is sit here and if you're uh watching the video of this um here here's my nice uh bright sad light um <laughs> that comes on to help me you know deal with that stuff yeah. but you know it, it's you know dark here uh most of the day you know in the northern hemisphere, yeah. and you, you got to do something about it. I also take some extra vitamin D. Um, it still doesn't stop it. Like my my body's like, you should be in the sun more. I'm like there is no sun. Yeah. When I was in in college at Lakeland College, um, there were a lot of people working in the factories around there. A lot of students that I, I knew, and some of them were working second or third shift, which meant that they were sleeping during the day, and that mm-hmm. meant that some of them didn't see the sun at all for like weeks on end and man did that do a number on them you know yeah that reminds me of you know i've I've definitely done that with work and school here both yeah. both you know you know you wake up you go to school it might be just barely light yeah yeah and you go through your entire day and it's all under you know um artificial lights and then you get out and it's already dark and it's like what (laughs) am i doing in this particular environment yeah i mean it could be worse we could be much further north where they get like you know eventually down to no sunlight for for part of the uh the year right right um yeah up in the arctic circle anything anything above the arctic circle will have at least a day of you know 24 hour no light which is just kind of mind-boggling. Yeah. Well, let's let's shift to talking about something that I think will have come up for quite a few of our listeners. What if you've already broken your New Year's resolution, right? Do you have to feel bad about that? Or is this instead an opportunity? And I think there's a whole range of possible attitudes and responses from the catastrophic, oh, this is so awful, I can't believe one more year that I didn't make my resolution, and then you just feel, you know, you like heap all sorts of guilt and shame upon yourself. Um, Some people will say, oh, well, you know, better luck next year, and then they just abandon the resolution. And I I think that's not actually a good stance either. Um, I I see No, because, like, we have... The ability to automatically reset, you know, uh, any, uh, you know, obviously the, the easiest one is to think about, you know, you, you put yourself on a diet. Okay. And and you, oh, you you cheat or something. And you're like, well, I've cheated once. I can just <laughs> cheat the rest of the day. And then you gorge yourself. Yeah. Now you're, you're setting yourself much back, much further back than maybe um, the, the, the one piece of candy that you may have eaten that you were not supposed to. You you have the ability to reassert your resolution at any point in time. There, there's no like you don't have to wait oh, until the next day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like well, I've got an infinite amount of moments between now and then. I can choose any one of them to get right back on the horse. I think people do that with uh, I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to quit smoking. You know, they're like, well, mm-hmm. 
uh, you know, some people give up coffee. I, I'm already off, so I may as well like smoke the whole pack. You know, <laughs> that doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever. Yeah, you're right. It's like I have a goal, and I'm going to do something to make it even worse. You know, I, another one that I think people do is they make deals with themselves. Uh, not only – so like take the people who they fall off the diet wagon and they're like, oh, I'm going to go like eat as much as I can today. And then they'll say, well, but I'm going to be really strict with myself going forward. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to make up for this somehow. I don't think that really works. I think no. that's setting yourself up for more and more failure. Yeah, in my opinion, consistency is the key here. Um, as much as you can keep consistent with the thing, you know, you don't try to fluctuate too much. You don't starve yourself and then gorge yourself as a, you know, or I guess you don't uh, starve yourself as a punishment for gorging yourself. Just go back to the the baseline. Try to keep that going. Yeah, I mean, if you fail in doing the extra thing, then you're going to feel even worse, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I've it's, also it's seen, like oh, go ahead. The basis of motivation. Go on. I, I've seen people deny after they've failed their resolution that they ever made the resolution in the first place. Oh, that's tough to do. <laughs> but I've, yeah. seen, I've seen people pull it off, you know? It's like, what is that? Like trying to protect your like ego or something to like, uh, oh, well. Yeah, I suppose so. I can never so, be wrong. Right? I, I, I succeeded at everything that I set my mind to. Yeah. So if I didn't do that, then I did not actually set my mind to that. Now, if you haven't broken your resolutions, I'm actually going to say, and I think Dan will go along with me, you have our permission to break as many of them as you want to. You can you can revise your re- your resolutions. You're not stuck with them just because you happen to send something on January 1st or you know uh, December 31st. We're the ones who are in charge of whatever resolutions we make. They don't they don't run the show for us. And so if they're not mm-hmm. helping you out, it's so you know it's okay to change them. It's okay to revise them. It's okay to you know uh, carve them down or replace them with additional ones or new ones or maybe you know if things are really bad, you could say I'm not doing any resolutions this year. You know. Yeah, um, it's kind of like. Thinking of these in kind of levels of abstraction. Okay. And so, what what are the things that you're uh, say say I want to um, run a half marathon? Okay. What what is that a a specific example of? Well, that's you know getting more fit. Okay. Um, and so you're getting more abstract and, and more general. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're going we're going up, and so um, I, I might be able to swap out like I did in my running example, um, because I was no longer able to physically run, yeah, yeah. but I was still continued uh, biking um, at, at a very high uh, level, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so I'm still like hitting this, like this kind of this meta idea of what the, the resolution was trying to do. Um, but just in a, a different specific uh example of it yeah you're asking yourself the question what was the point what was the Mm -hmm. goal what was the the end that i was after and then you're saying another thing could satisfy that same goal but also as you're saying it might be that the end was wrong you realize that 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 end was not the thing that you were wanting really in the first place um and you should like as you said it's up to you it's your reevaluation um uh, so, I would say don't be too wishy-washy about that. Uh, you don't, you know, it, if you're going to set out a resolution, at least try it for a month. Um, <laughs> see what happens. Yeah, experiment. See, see what, you know, like th- that's definitely enough time to try to like feel out how this thing is going. If it's going really, really bad, yeah, you can change it. But, uh, you know, don't, don't wimp out in the first day. I guess you could say that. You know, failing could be positive in that you you realize that um, you know this. I shouldn't make these sort of resolutions, or this is a little bit too much for me, or you know, you you could go better at it the next time around. But I want I want to come back to this notion of goals because there's um, you know you can make a resolution, but that's something different than a goal, right? Right. Why, why is a goal better than making a resolution 
Um, you know, I'm going to let you do this because I don't know if I totally agree with you. Oh, okay. I So it's, it's connected to what you were bringing up, like figuring out what you're really looking at. I think that resolutions in a lot of cases are at best means to an end. And the goal is what we really want. Like in your case, you know, uh, to not just have better health, but to establish a regular exercise pattern and enjoy being outside, right? Those are all, those are, those could all be goals, things that you value. Mm. And when you make something a goal, um, see with a resolution, you, you either stick to it or you break it. And if it's something like I'm going to read 10 pages from this text every day, you know, um, I've got Seneca's on benefits here. Now you could, you could read, you know, 10 pages from that every day. You'd read through the book a number of times over the years, over the year. Um, <clears throat> but what happens if you miss a day? You, you've broken your resolution. You feel like crap, you know, mm-hmm. resolutions like the one that you made about the doing a half marathon. That's a little bit different because you're saying, I'm going to do this thing at the end of this. So that's a little bit further down the path towards almost more like a, a secondary goal, right? But if I yeah. say something like, I, you know, I'm going to lose um, a certain amount of weight or I am going to, you know, master Mandarin this year, <laughs> something like that. Um, I should ask myself, well, why do I want to learn Mandarin? You know, is it so that I can read um, classical Chinese philosophy? Well, Mandarin is actually not going to, it'll help a little bit with that, but that's not the same thing as classical Chinese. So maybe that resolution isn't achieving that that goal or it's only a sufficient but not uh, it's only a necessary but not sufficient condition for achieving that goal and i think that if you if you f- reframe things as goals you're probably for most people better off than than working with a resolution now you see it differently so tell me where you think that this is so off base um- Yes, this is from uh, at least a, a number of you know sociological studies about uh, how we actually get to these goals. Okay, and it's great to have kind of these big goals as kind of an idea of like, okay, say I want to lose you know twenty fifty pounds. Okay, um, it's that's a really big thing that's really really far off and it's not easily actionable on a day to day basis. That's um, true. And so yeah, this yeah, is kind yeah, of like yeah. your um. You now need to make a, a plan in how to actually implement that. Yeah. And now the thing that is better for you, especially in the long run, and it helps you maintain these good uh, habits, um, even after you hit these goals, mm-hmm. is to set up, okay, well, um, I want to, instead of lose 50 pounds, that I'm going to go to the gym uh, three Regular, to five times a yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and Build in that it's part of your everyday life, and eventually you're going to hit these goals regardless. But now your your goal hasn't actually gone away. You yeah. still have that uh, the goal of actually maintaining that you know three to five times away. And so these routines, uh, not goals to achieve long term success, uh, result in in basically long term behavior change and habits. You've you've basically described, but not three to five times, just. At best, three times a week, what I did with the weight circuits and, and losing weight in, in this case. And I think you're right. I, so I think maybe we've got to sum it up real quick because we're almost at the, the end. Uh, we've got like big long term goals. We've got resolutions that we can make if we want to. And then we've got all these, what would you want to call them, Im- implementation steps that are that are needed along the way. Yeah, these actionable steps. Okay, yeah. And, yeah. and I would say, like at least my opinion, uh, and from these studies, is the uh, the the actionable steps that are easy to do and and make them as easy as possible. Yeah. So, for example, um, you don't even need to go and work out at the gym. Just make sure that you go to the gym and make that into a yeah. <laughs> you just hang around. Drive, drive to the gym, walk in. <laughs> okay. Do one jumping jack, get out, and, and that's that's the very minimum that you need. But just make it so you're always doing it. Okay. Well, you want to lead us out on some final thoughts, then? Yes. With the words of Melody Beatty, the new year stands before us like a chapter in a book waiting to be written. We can help write that story by setting goals. Goals.